Welcome back to another week of the Field of 68's Best Bets here on YouTube, powered by Bet Rivers. We're also live on Twitter, of course. We are the three-man weave here to talk you through a Monday slate. I am your host, Jim Root, joined by Kai McEwen and Matt Cox. Boy, fellas, quick takeaways. I am in a rut, an ice-cold best bet slate right now. I believe I've got five in a row losses. You guys carried me on Saturday to, thankfully, a winning day for the weave. Matt, what else did you see this weekend other than uh, your your terrible teammate here weighing you down? Uh, yeah, it was frustrating because I think I've been annoying to the point where I've just bombarded, bombarded people's ears, Kai, with my uh, home court means everything in the Big Ten. Uh, also talked about that in other leagues, but uh, sure enough, Wisconsin, uh, Indiana failed to cover at home. Uh, just some interesting trends in that way from the weekend. I think maybe that some of these teams on the road late in the conference season guys may not be as um, may not roll over as easily, I guess, guys, we've seen that early in the year. So just kind of a don't, macro trend I have my eye on. Don't worry, though, Matt, because Northwestern and Purdue and well, several other home teams covered. So Northwestern still- is no Northwestern's an outlier, Jim. They're the best team in the country, apparently. So we'll talk about them, <laughs> I assume, at some point uh, this week. But I don't understand yeah. that. I don't. Well, it, that is my take. But Northwestern is... Um, I guess really good. It's still kind of funny. They're 42nd in Kempom. Um, they just don't seem to move up that much when they get these big wins. Um, there's some inertia to their ratings, apparently. I, and truthfully, on, on neutral courts, I'd still probably have them dogs to 40 teams in the country. But they beat Iowa by 20. Uh, they are in second place in the Big Ten. They are a sixth seed right now in the Matrix. And They've been objectively impressive. It's like they switched bodies with Ohio State this year, Jim. Ohio State 3-13 and in the Big Ten. Probably more performance we saw the, uh, that coming from Northwestern. But here they are. They're going to the NCAA tournament, man. It's exciting. In- invasion of the body snatchers. Yeah, Ohio mm-hmm. State's one home win over Iowa away from pulling your Chris Collins, Chris, or Kai, which would be <laughs> losing 10 games in a row in the Big Ten. Something Oof. he traditionally did annually, but he's turned it around this year. So impressive stuff from Northwestern. My takeaway is... These Carolina Blue Boys are not very good. Sorry mm. to our producer, Jacob, behind the scenes, a UNC grad. But, man, tough loss at NC State. Now 5-11 and 11 against Q1, Q2 competition. I, it's it's like they're not even like last team. They're N-I-T. Out like they are, yeah, they're. Dangerous NIT team, though, guys. That's probably my early, if you're looking yeah. for value in that market. Actually, I think Circuit's most books will put out early NIT line. It's kind of a fun handicap. You have to, like, think of it. In multiple layers. Which books? So I kind of like no that. books. No books here, of course, man. Uh, the redacted book. Uh, I think Bet Rivers <laughs> may offer them. They thought they offer them last year. No? They have NIT lines yeah. for sure. Yeah. 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 Check those out. Actually, only check how about, those out. How about ACC tournament lines? How about that? UNC will be a popular choice, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Matt, where's the final four of the NIT this year? <sighs> Not at the Garden, right? Which is ridiculous. <sighs> Where is it? I, I have no clue. Vegas. Oh, wow. Vegas. Oh, okay. All right. I'm back in officially. Still a little bit annoyed that I think the guard is a sacred, sacred heart, hardwood hoops. Yeah, it's at the Orleans. But all right, let's get into today's slate, guys. We'll pivot to today. Two teams that looked absolutely dominant over the weekend. That would be Kansas and TCU. Kai, Kansas with a little first half head fake, get yeah. down to a hot shooting Baylor squad. And then the second half of all second halves, 55 to 26, demolished Baylor. That was the A plus game from Kansas mm-hmm. that we. And maybe not have come become accustomed to seeing, but we know it's in there. Meanwhile, TCU gets Mike Miles back and obliterates Oklahoma State. Yeah. They've been awesome with Miles recently. How do you look at this game? TCU, a one and a half point home favorite here. Kansas, by the way, 13 key one wins. The next highest is nine. They could be the number one overall seed when all is said and done. It, their resume is stupid. Number one strength of schedule also. But yeah, this game. Mike Miles, obviously huge. Uh, without him in the lineup, those four games that he missed recently, 0-4 against the spread, straight up. Overall, during the entire season, 1-5. With Miles in the lineup, 13-7 against the spread, clearly a much better team, much higher ceiling. Um, Kansas, Jim mentioned, to beat Baylor by 29 points in 20 minutes is pretty ridiculous. Uh, clearly, they were firing on all cylinders. Now, this game is at TCU, and we did see, Matt, TCU punk Kansas at the fog by 23 earlier this season. Can they do it again? Perhaps I, I am sort of leaning towards TCU. It's come back down a little bit to one and a half. They took money up to minus two. Yeah. It is a huge spot for them still uh, to get another quality win, to get over that 500 mark in the big 12. And KU seems if I was KU, I'd be, Oh, we're a one seed. We're pretty much locked in there. Yeah. Obviously still playing yeah. for something, still trying hard. They're college athletes, but I lean towards TCU here at minus one and a half. 
I do too. Just terrified of that uh, Bill Self in conference revenge angle. We talked about at nauseum over the weekend. So I don't like going against that. Um, and the second half promptly reminded as to why that's probably there's some real teeth to that data. Um, it does feel like a cheap price. So we're getting the good TCU, one of the stronger, you know, against good competition with all your horses versus, you know, what they've done without. So I think there is value here on the Horn Frogs. Man, I don't know. I just can't go against Bill Self right now, just given that, you know, we talked about that angle. I think it's very real coming down the stretch for Big 12 play, Jimbo. Matt, let me throw it right back to you. Do you think that that is mitigated at all by the quick turnaround, having to go on the road, maybe less time for adjustments, 48 hours here? Uh, is yeah. there something to that? And the nature in which they came back, right? When like they cruised to a Baylor, when they had to really like turn on the Jets there for a full 25 minutes to cement that comeback. Um, so yeah, I, I'm i still on TCU side here. I don't know why, sure, I haven't, why I haven't laid this yet, Kai. Just something about Kansas scares me. Yeah, I, I lean TCU as well. Um, Kai, you mentioned the mile stats. He actually just missed, I'm calling it six games because he right. got hurt uh and that when they were yeah one and five against the spread the last six he has played five and one against the spread with an average cover margin mm-hmm. of 13 like they are yeah. smashing different teams, teams. yeah yeah and uh, yeah i think they're very undervalued in some of the predictive stuff because of that i think they're like a top 10 team maybe even like top eight with him in there. i agree and mm-hmm. uh, maybe i'm you know going too far on that one but i am a horn frog believer um, yeah matt you mentioned the the bill self turnaround stuff I, I do think like just with 48 hours you don't have time to have a like super specific game plan yeah. i'm sure they were watching film uh, of tcu a little before that as a coaching staff but you're definitely not introducing that to your players with that baylor game on deck so uh, given what tcu did to them in the first game i lean i lean the horned frogs as well the one matchup or or you know maybe anomaly from that game is tcu was hot early they hit a bunch of threes and i think that changes the complexion of the game it got them, you know, Kansas was already trying to recover from that one. It never really ended up able to do so. Yeah. Their supporting cast did nothing. Jalen Wilson had 30. The rest of the team had 30. So yeah, we'll, we'll see if they're able to give a better effort. I think DeJuan Harris had like 16 in the second half alone against Baylor. Yeah, uh, Lampkin was, do? Lampkin struggled last game, but like, I don't think they need him in this matchup. It'd be nice to have him as like an X factor, but even if he's sort of not at 100% or at his best, it's not a huge issue against Kansas in this one. Yep, yep. All right, next up, the other Big 12 game of the night. That is Oklahoma State at West Virginia. Mountaineers really starting to put themselves in a tough spot, backing their way to the bubble. Just too many losses at this point. Matthew, they are laying five against Oklahoma State, who had been trending up until they got uh, they ran into the TCU wagon over the weekend. What are you looking at with this one? Yeah, do we think the pokes are maybe being slept on in the spot because they just played Kansas and TCU? Uh, maybe you get like a, a poke after that reminds you of the Oklahoma, TCU, Texas Tech, Iowa State four game win streak. They put they put forth right ahead of that with CSA back. And obviously, we talked about how Caleb Boone's been the engine for that team uh, without Avery Anderson on the perimeter, who's out. So we've been worrying about kind of their backcourt, but it's been good enough for me. I kind of am all the way out on West Virginia at this point. Um, I just think that they're wow. the situationals. I know, and I've been the I've been the big. I know. I'm sorry, I've been a Huggins guy all year, and I just don't see enough consistency with this team. I don't. I think all their wins, you go back and look at them, they're in good spots. The, they play teams at the right time of the year and their inflection point. I think the Pokes going to win here tonight. Yeah, uh, they've played well without Avery Anderson, but but they have dropped their last two straight up and against the spread. Good teams they played in those two games, but still, maybe it is catching up with them a bit. And Jim mentioned West Virginia is in danger zone. Three straight losses. Texas Tech at home was their last one. They're still a ten seed in the in the bracket matrix right now, but fifteen and twelve, four and ten in the big in the Big Twelve. That's an eyesore. Oklahoma State won game one. It was ugly. West Virginia scored 0.88 points per possession. I know we had some questions about the under in this game. I do lean towards that. Uh, Efficiency is not really what you want to look at usually when you're looking at totals. It's usually pace. And the first game played 68 possessions. Relatively slow for these two teams in the Big 12. And West Virginia has been playing very slow in conference play. So I guess I would lean towards the under here, especially no Avery Anderson. That kind of de-incentivizes Oklahoma State to run and obviously hurts their scoring. Western is much better at home this season, Jim. It should be a highly motivated spot for them, but five does seem a bit high or at least a lot around the right number. I'm staying away. Yeah, I think these teams is closer to equal rather than West Virginia better on a neutral. I think they're almost the opposite of TCU where their predictive stuff is a little inflated from some early season blowouts. Um, the beating Florida by 30 is is definitely helping yeah. continue to inflate that a little bit. That kind of that kind of result. Um I just I don't see them like they they've only won two Big Twelve games by five uh, by more than five excuse me um, uh, excuse me three but one of them was on the road 
it's just not a team that's been blowing quality competition out in the league. And Oklahoma State's been really feisty. I also like the under. Uh, I, I think that the tempo is slower and with no Anderson and more CSA back in the lineup for Oklahoma State. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, trends that way. Oklahoma State just played a track meet with TCU, but I think it just turned into a, a pickup game in the second half when it was a 25-point 25, 25 margin the whole way. So lean under, lean Oklahoma State in that one. One more Big angle 10. there. What West Virginia, they've been a strong first half, second half split team. They've been blowing a lot of leads lately. West Virginia fans would tell you that. So maybe target West Virginia first half if you must. Also, I mean, how many crazy second half comebacks have we seen Saturday? Maybe this is like a a theme. Probably could just be variants, guy, but just uh it's in the back of your mind. Let's go to Minnesota at Illinois. Big Ten country. Matt, you talked about Big Ten home. I will just give the updated stat on that. It's actually getting stronger, Kai, where it's like 62% <laughs> for the year. But since January 12th, it's 50 and 24 against the spread. So like 68%. It has been ridiculous. You are really getting dicey trying to find the other side of that, trying to find a couple road teams that will cover. So why should we not back the Illini at home? Yeah, well, big time kudos to Illinois to begin with for their effort against Indiana. That was impressive. They they led most of the game without Terrence Shannon. And Rad Underwood said after the game, three guys had strep throat. Um, whether that's an excuse or not, we'll see. But still, an impressive effort. I, I was impressed by Illinois, um, especially after they rolled over against Indiana at their place. It should be a nice, relaxing win for them tonight, frankly. Uh, they smoked Minnesota at the barn by 18. The Gophers just aren't on the same level as the good Big Ten teams. They're 222nd in Kempom. Matt, Ben Johnson knows how to muck games up, knows how to slow pace, and perhaps Illinois is a bit sleepy, and this one stays in the low double digits, but Minnesota's offense has no juice, and I think Coleman Hawkins is a pretty perfect counter to Dawson Garcia uh, defensively. I lean slightly to Illinois at minus 14.5, but it is a lot to lay, kind of a sleepy spot. Yeah, it is, and this is getting to a part of the schedule where, for example, Minnesota has, they play Wednesday and then again on Saturday, uh, Illinois plays Thursday, Sunday. So it's getting to a pretty condensed part where if you're the favorite, maybe you're not looking to run your horses out there for 35 minutes, but Illinois is deep. We've seen their guards, like these young guards really step up. I think they have more weapons and they took Indiana wire to wire without Terrence Chan. I mean, that was a pretty impressive effort in my opinion from Illinois, uh, even though they did not get that win. I still lean their way. Minnesota has just been non-competitive. It's that simple, right? You can't stay within 10 points against Iowa, Maryland, Rutgers at home or Rutgers on the road, Northwestern on the road, Iowa at home. Um, they really haven't played a good game since uh, January 25th against Indiana, which was a sleepy spot for IU there too. So I, I'd lay Illinois, I think here, if you have to take some. Yeah. Especially Minnesota on the road, like the recent results have been lost by 35 at Rutgers, 20 at Northwestern competed at Michigan. Okay. Tip of the cap, but Michigan is kind of their own, uh, has their own issues. So yeah, I, I, Minnesota, not a team. I'm a huge fan of Matt. I feel like you kind of talked yourself in Delonte's angle from the chat, the first half Illinois, uh, you're, yeah. you're saying with that schedule spot, maybe you don't want to push your starters late in this game. However, Illinois is pretty deep with Goody and Melendez back. They want to see those guys have the, you know, have some shots go through uh, and, and have that rotation set as they go down the, po- or down the stretch into the postseason. I, I just have to lean towards the home team and Minnesota not being super strong right now. Yeah. Worth mentioning, obviously, Dawson Garcia came back last game. Like, he missed a, a bunch of games before. It's almost like that team gets so underreported, we don't even think about them, that they exist. But, yeah, I mean, yeah. he had 23-7. and uh, seven. So, I mean, matters to some degree. Yeah. Shannon's status also TBD with that concussion. He didn't travel. Like, so he wasn't even close to playing um, this weekend. We'll see if he's able to get right for this one 48 hours later. All right, next up, the ACC Louisville at Duke. Duke playing 18, but Louisville, oh, competitive, potentially booting mm-hmm. Clemson out of the tournament this weekend. Kai, I'll go to you first here. Is that a sign of Louisville is feisty and starting to figure things out? Or are we just kind of writing yeah. that off as Clemson was never as good as the top of the <sighs> ACC that they appeared? Yeah, definitely not that good. Uh, both teams kind of turning back up. Duke off that huge win at Syracuse. Um, that, that was impressive, convincing. And yeah, Louisville took down Clemson by 10. Don't look now. Louisville's covered three in a row, and they've covered five of the last six games also. They're, they have a little fight in them. Maybe it's a whole, hey, we're, let's prove we're not basement material in the ACC and we're at least a decent basketball team. And fading Duke has not been a bad idea this season in general. They're 10 and 17 against the spread. It's a massive spread tonight, 18 points. We know Louisville is poor, but that is a lot of points. And, and Louisville does have some confidence. Again, they've been putting forth some high effort lately. Um, while the cards don't use it effectively, Matt, in my opinion, they do have a ton of size to throw at Duke, uh, who is the biggest team in the country. Louisville's the 10th biggest, something like that. And Duke doesn't really force turnovers. They're not really going to punish Louisville's 
lack of guards, their their thin backcourt. I'm going with the hotter team right now. That's Louisville. My best bet is Louisville plus 18. Love it. Yeah, I, I kind of think Duke's a buy low, but I think in this spot, it's a great time to fade them. They're just not a good team. They're not a good favorite team, in my opinion. They're playing slower, as Kai mentioned. They tend to get kind of dragged down into more half-court brawls when really they should be probably trying to in- showcase some of their talent and skill, you know, transition more opportunistically. Tariq Whitehead's been a huge game changer. I mean, he was basically the difference in the Virginia game and the Syracuse game last last time or last week and, you know, hitting shots off the bench. Um, you know, Louisville's got a soft defense. You can make shots over that, but still, I don't think Duke, the way this team's constructed the form they're in right now, Jim, I would not lay 18. It's a hard lean to Louisville for me. Yeah. Whitehead's looking good. Lively's starting to put up some really like lively S lines, you know, not too much scoring, but the, nice. the rebounds, the blocks, like you're starting to get the production from these top three recruits that you were hoping for right. coming into the year. Duke hasn't been healthy most of the season between Roach, Lively, Whitehead. Uh, that's been an issue. But yeah, I, I just I, I like Louisville the way they've been playing lately. Kai, what you mentioned, covering games, and remember what happened last time Duke played a Monday game off a big win. They turned around and got smacked by Miami. Mm. It's a young team; they might not have the maturity level to maintain the same intensity within uh, close proximity to another victory. So I, I think Louisville hangs around as well. Let's go to chat mob part one. Matthew, I believe you're my czar. Yeah, not a lot of specific questions. Uh, no love for the SWAC today, people. Nothing on the outline, but yet no questions on any questions. I'll be honest, though, my takes have not been good in the SWAC, so I'm okay with that. Uh, but we have an opening macro question from Jeff, Jim, and Kai to both of you. Once to know if you guys have a take on the Big 12 and the hyper competitiveness, wear and tear playing a factor come March. Do we think these teams could be net fades in the tournament? They've just basically beaten each other into oblivion and they have nothing left. Anything to that? No. No, nope, I, I don't. Absolutely. I don't buy that narrative at all. I think these Big Ten. Okay. Awesome. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I think. Yeah. I think that's been slapped on the Big Ten in years past as part of like the why Big Ten sucks in the tournament. That's one of the more fickle reasons why, but that has been a, a tag applied. Just, I've just think: are they playing that much better competition that they're tired, more tired in the tournament to not play? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, right. never yeah, bought that we'll angle. I, I think the Big Ten narrative should be a lot more about it's a big man, the style, and it's yeah, how their teams are constructed. Is, like, yeah, yeah. Then, yeah. Um, Let's hit the two Big West questions or games not on the outline. UC Riverside, Cal State, Northridge. Jim, can we say our Matadors? Not really. I kind of dis- disavowed them at some point, but uh, they're catching a lot. Of UC Riverside, he's been kind of good. The Magpies, but two massive wins over Long Beach and Santa Barbara, their last two. What do you like here? Yeah. Yeah. The Northridge was a team I bet like every game to start the year. And sometimes it went well, sometimes it went really, really poorly. I lean their way here, though. Um, I, I think Riverside, you're catching them in a tougher spot. Like you said, of that huge Santa Barbara win, which, again, we're going to talk Santa Barbara after the chat mob break. Something's up with them. Uh, but I, I lean towards Northridge at home. Yeah. Seven's not really enough for me to take it. They've been better at home. Uh, I don't know. I think I've just noticed those road splits last week. But uh, weird teams, I'll say on both sides, especially CSUN, very Jekyll and Heidi. Kai, I'm going to holster Hawaii Bakersfield for Matthew Cox's best bet today. Uh, UC San Diego, UC Davis is the other Big West game on the outline. Uh, my Tritons have been a little bit better recently, by the way. They got uh, yeah. Timmy Shanga back. I can't say Shimanga. 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 Very important Shimanga. guy defensively. Very Shimanga. important because they have Jimmy Changa. I'll call him Jimmy Changa. That's fine. They don't have a lot of talent, but I think he's huge. So I kind of like taking nine with them on the road. Thoughts? No real thoughts here. No, I, I travel. You know California geography better than I do, of course. Can't be that much. Um no, I don't no, like so it, San Diego this year, so stay away. That's probably five hour drive, I'm guessing. That's kind of a mid to NorCal to so to SoCal thing. Um <laughs> Jim, that is literally all we have in the outline. There's been minimal questions uh about specific games. So Matt, we'll, we'll hit a hard North- swack. Okay. Or Norfolk Coppin State. I just saw that one pop up. Norfolk's uh, been rolled. Awesome. Yeah, I would lay it with 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 Coppin and Morgan are not like categorically worse this year. I think you have to kind of reassess reassess your um perception on both there so yeah 15 is a lot but i'd lay it with norfolk yeah all right let's go back to the outline and let's talk more big west matthew cal state fullerton at uc santa barbara two teams kind of going in different directions fullerton's been one of the better cover teams in february this year uh, and santa barbara lost two in a row i thought getting andre kelly back and still still being right there for the big west title would be enough to get them past riverside not true so uh, are you continuing to fade uc santa barbara here they're laying six at home against the Titans. Uh, the price felt right to me, to be honest. And they, Sunny was out last game too. He's probably their second best guard behind Mitchell. Um, it was once upon a time, maybe their best guard a year ago, but it's a really talented team is the point. 
still don't like the form then right now, Kai. And I certainly like how Fullerton's been playing, who has really surprised me this year. Like I thought they're just kind of a ragtag collection of like role players, but you know, 10 and six, they've been covering spreads, four straight wins, almost beat Long Beach at home before that. I, I lean toward the Titans, the, sorry, the Titans here, excuse me. Uh, yeah, Jim mentioned Fullerton's success this year in February. They, they've come on really strong recently. And reminder, this team was the auto bid last year from the Big West. They, they've had experience uh, performing well late in the season before under uh, uh, Turner, Taylor, excuse me, Taylor, their head coach. Uh, Babs, the, the the second loss, Jim, to Riverside, so disappointing. They, they've fallen now to second place behind Irvine. Um, these two did play way back on December 29th. It's been a long time since they played. It was a close game. Fullerton led by one with a minute 30 left. Santa Barbara pulled it out. Fullerton had 21 turnovers. I still think Santa Barbara is the best team in this league. They have too much talent not to be, but Fullerton's scrappy, man. They just stick around. They have the number one defense in the Big West. They're so tough. Usually as a dog jam, especially a six-point dog, I lean towards Fullerton. I'm going to go the other way. I'll, I'll take Santa Barbara here. I'm not super amped about it. Not my best bet or anything. I do think Fullerton is one of those teams we discussed that is heavy on free throws. They've been that way forever under Taylor. They love to get to the rim. They love to get to the line. Now they're on the road, maybe not as friendly of a whistle. I think that could be an issue for them. And as Kelly points out, UCSB way bigger inside. I think they can kind of smash a little bit in the paint. They did so somewhat successfully in the first meeting. And and hopefully uh, UCSB is a little bit locked in after two straight losses. Uh, I'll buy low with what Kai said. I agree. The best team in the league. But they are not leading the league. That would be UC Irvine. And we're going to discuss the Anteaters now. They are on the road at Cal Poly. Laying 11 here, Kai. Anteaters are rolling maybe all the way to a league title right now. Do you think Cal Poly can at least keep it close? Well, I don't know, Jim. They were supposed to be a lot better this year, old Cal Poly. They were 21st in the country in returning minutes. Instead, they're 1-15 in in the Big West. They've lost 15 in a row. They were good. Yeah, Matt Matt called them out early as not being good this year. He was right. Uh, they're six and nine against the spread in that fifteen game losing streak. So not like horrible from a from a number perspective. Uh, and game one was somehow close. It was the first game. Uh, Bain Leuchten was backed for UC Irvine, and they beat Cal Poly by one point. Um, the Mustangs can make games ugly. Their defense is decent, but I think Irvine outclassed them today. They they are a much better team. They they remember that one point game, Matthew. The spread's a bit high at 11, but I, I wouldn't yeah. uh, take Polly here. Yeah, it opened at 9. I wouldn't lay it now at 11 for sure. I just don't think Irvine profiles is like an awesome favorite. I know they're scoring more this year. They have better shot making than they have in the past, but I mean, snuck by UC Davis. They were up big against UC Davis. I think they actually, Davis had a huge lead, or sorry, had a huge comeback to make that closer than what it looked like. That was in the wake of the Santa Barbara win, which was an asterisk as well because Santa Barbara was down Andre Kelly. Riverside at home, and then that poly game you mentioned, they won by one. I don't know, Jim. I think I lean that way if you have to play some, but I wouldn't lay at 11 at the current number. Yeah, I'm, I'm not betting this one either. It, it, like you guys said, it, it, they've been a little erratic, and that's because they're so reliant on shot making. Like They can put a run on you, uh, given the, the fact that they're an elite three-point shooting team, but if they're cold, that's kind of an issue. Maybe they're less reliant on it now with Lichten back. Uh, that could be a big factor for them, and yeah, they've been efficient against two pretty good defenses the last two games. So yeah, this I don't have a, a good enough read on how bad Polly is. Are they just like totally abysmal? I don't know. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stay away from that one. Let's go to the Miac. Uh, I saw some chatter about this game coming through in the chat. So we're gonna talk Howard at Morgan State. Howard atop the Miac standings right now. Kyle, go to you first here. They're laying six and a half against a team that has been pretty poor since Malik Miller went out. I think you can draw a fairly straight line between Morgan mm-hmm. State's ATS results and his presence. Is that what you're looking at in this handicap? Yep, they've been terrible since the injury bug. It's not the same team. Uh, Miller's missed the last seven games. They're two and five straight up and against the spread in that span. And one of their wins, by the way, was Norfolk State. Somehow they they beat Norfolk without Miller. It was like the first game he was out. It's really strange. Yep, that weird um, boost teams get from that. Yeah. Howard's been dynamite in, in the MEAC. They're 9-1 yeah. and one overall. They're currently in first place. This spread, minus six and a half on the road. I mean, I'm pretty sure Kim Pom has this at two. Obviously, the injuries are a factor, and Morgan State's nowhere near their, their analytical ranking in Kim Pom right now. Current form is just not there. And Howard also beat Morgan by 32 in the first game. That's the game Miller got hurt, by the way. It's hard to it's hard to take the points of Morgan here, Matt. Just the way they've been playing, the way Howard's been playing, the way that first matchup went. I'd probably go Howard or nothing, but it's a stay away for me at six and a half. 
Jim, there's always a point where you can vet the other side in the game, right? Game's open, open three and a half. It's up to six and a half, seven. If it got to 10, would you take Morgan? If it got to 15, would you take, like, there's always a price, uh, a four point move at this point in the year just makes me temp- t- tempted, excuse me, to want to punch back. But no, uh, Morgan State's just that bad and Howard's just that good. So I guess I get the extreme money. Yeah. And Howard rolling as the season goes on makes a lot of sense. They play like 10 guys every game. <laughs> Uh, around December, they had uh, three guys out, Hawkins, Odom, and Dockery. And it was like, all right, they're not the full self. They figured out who they are now. Those guys are rolling. They're all starting. They've played like the same starting lineup for, I think, eight straight games now uh, in a similar rotation. This is the kind of how we're, they have the talent. Like between down transfers and some of the recruits they've gotten, it kind of adds up that they're this good in league play. And with Morgan State limited by the injuries, I, I have no interest in them. Uh, it's Howard for me. I, I would lay the six and a half still now. All right. The other one on the outline from this conference is NC Central and Maryland Eastern Shore. Two teams that are, uh, you know, they were in the title hunt, but unfortunately they've fallen off a bit. Kai, NC Central laying two. You know what? No, I'm going to Matt first. Sorry. I, I've been I've been hogging the ball. I don't have a you. take here. I have zero. Favoring take. me. Your favorite. Yeah, I'm favoring you. Uh, no, Matt, you're, you're going to find a take. What do you got for us? NC Central minus two at Eastern Shore. Well, the market loves NC Central. Opened uh, UMass has a slight favorite now. It's up heavily to NC Central. I think they're just the more talented, higher class team. Um, I think just in general, UMass's advantage over people is their their effort. Right? They kind of just I think they just scrap. Um, NC Central is just I think they can combat that guy. I, I don't really see their usual tricks and and whatever working today. So I'm going NC Central. No hard, no hot take though. Yeah, Maryland Eastern Shore. We mentioned it. They've been really good uh, this season in the MEAC. They just got back in the win column after two tough losses to the best teams in the MEAC. So they're, they're playing good competition, those two losses. It wasn't just a, a losing to the dregs of the league. And NC Central is very talented. Um, they just can't seem to get over the hump against the big dogs. They lost to Maryland Eastern Shore by one earlier this year. They lost by four to Howard on the road. They lost by six to Norfolk on the road. So they're keeping these games close with the good teams. They just can't get the win. And now they're favored by two on the road here at UMES, it kind of made me scratch my head. Kim Palm's got this UMES minus one. I think it's due to injuries. Fofana and Voiles both missed last game for Maryland Eastern Shore. Guys are in and out of the lineups all the time in this league. It's kind of hard to peg who actually matters. But Fofana, really talented guard uh, uh, for, for yeah. UMES. I think he does matter. Game one was ugly. UMES certainly does force turnovers. Forced 24 in game one. They have the highest turnover rate in the league defensively. New- NC Central, not a great ball handling team. I need to see the health of the, of, uh, of UMES to take the points with them. Otherwise, staying away. Yeah, Voile's numbers don't really jump off the page either, but he fits that defensive scheme. They're really switchy, and they can get up in you. That's where all the, the turnovers come from. Like Everybody in their rotation is high in steal rate because they're allowed to gamble, and they've got some pretty good defenders in there. Phillip is like a fantastic defender. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't have a strong take in this one. I, I do think with the switching, a talented team can beat Eastern Shore because you uh, end up with mismatches and Central might be able to take advantage of that. Uh, but I'm not quite there enough to lay two on the road. Could could maybe get behind like a, a money line there and have the extra juice, but uh, not not strong enough to advise that as a wager. Now let's get back to chat mob. I know there are maybe a couple other questions coming through. It doesn't seem like your swag's getting love. No, we can just run through a few. Could be any hot takes on, let's say, Kai. How about let's go down to the Valley, the Delta Devils. They're getting 11 at Prairie View. Been a cover darling this season, by the way. Check their ATS numbers. They are shockingly profitable. Um, is that enough, though, to take them against the Panthers? I don't know, Matt. I had no take in this game. And <laughs> reporting live from Best Bets, that is kind of We can, can skip the non-check questions. Um, <laughs> hey, let's Jim, let's... It's 6 and 1 against the spread at home. I don't know. That's not as strong on the road. Now it's right on the road. Jim, uh, how about the other Houston team and the uh, swag? Texas Southern laying seven to Pine Bluff. I'm just out on Texas Southern. They've taken money here. Another health here than they were earlier in, in the season, but uh, I kind of like Pine Bluff here if you have to get involved. Yeah, I, I take the take the points in that one. Texas Southern, I think, can get up for some of the better teams. Uh, I bet them against Southern last Monday, and they won on the road. But they at lesser teams, I think they can get distracted and, and not come with the same effort. That's maybe typical of a Johnny Jones team. Sorry, Mr. Jones. Uh, but yeah, I would lean towards Pine Bluff. All right, Kai, best bets. It's time. Let's do it. Reminder of mine, it is Louisville plus 18 at Duke. Fade the Dukies. Go Louisville, go Cardinals. Five and one against the spread last six. Let's keep that. Let's keep that hot streak going. Jim. 
Texas A&M Commerce. I think Joey called it out at the beginning of the chat. He's like, you're doing <laughs> yeah. the best marketing for Texas A&M Commerce lines, by baby. just repeatedly betting their unders. Uh, yeah, and it's been okay. It has not been maybe as strong as I thought it might be in this league, being that they're the slowest team offensively. They're better defensively than an offense. But the first time these two played, it was 64 possessions, didn't even hit 130 points, really low scoring. And this is a strange schedule spot. The Southland never plays on Monday. This is a rescheduled game due to a snowstorm. I think that might kind of mess up uh, Nichols' ability to push the pace here. I like the idea that Commerce wants it slow in a strange schedule spot. So I would take that under 145 and a half, Matthias. Uh, my best bet, shameful. I'm going to go against the Bows. I'm going with Shake and Bake today, Kai. Shake and Bake, great spot That's here. Okay. Been off since last Wednesday. They're playing today, Hawaii, on their second game in three days on the uh, the mainland trip here. Just got a huge one over Long Beach, which, by the way, we endorsed on this program. So now I'm going to zig against the zag, and I think the Bows come out a little bit flat today against a team who's, by the way, playing kind of good recently, um, despite having like five and a half players and guys who are completely inept at making jump shots. Shake and Bake's been actually scoring recently. They're actually five and zero to the over, I think, in the last five. I think they score enough to uh, to stay within six. Um, don't see Hawaii scoring more than 65 in this game. It's going to be a tough mountain to climb for the road, Bows. Take the uh, the runners, Jimbo. Matt, this is like uh, when you're you're engaging in some inappropriate behavior and you lower the picture. And you don't, don't let people look at you. You got to turn your your Hawaii pennant around when you're betting against them. <laughs> don't, let them don't let them see. Uh, all right, that's it for our Monday show. Thank you for tuning in. We'll obviously have a much beefier slate tomorrow when the power conferences get back in action on a Tuesday. Lots more coming then. We're here Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Saturday, of course. Uh, But thank you to Jacob behind the scenes, our producer. We'll see you all tomorrow. 